Let me congratulate you right away. Yes, you. I know from the stats that video is showing lots of gold and ideally revealing the location because you might recognize the mountain structure in the background or a distinctive rock in the river. Always get way more clicks than those about gold. Prospecting with a geological background. And yet, you're here. Why? Because you're not naive. Because we're a small, select group that understands just how important gold prospecting is for our hobby. Yes, gold prospecting is incredibly important. Okay. And for that, you should give yourselves a well-deserved pat on the back. And yet, you're here because you're not fools. Because we are a very small and select group that knows exactly how important gold prospecting is for our gold hobby. Ja, die Goldprospektion ist wichtig für uns Goldsucher. Und dafür yes, gold prospecting is incredibly important, so go ahead and give yourselves a pat on the back. The Ordovician and Silurian periods span approximately 485 to 419 million years ago and play a pivotal role in Earth's geological and biological history. Tectonic activity during the Ordovician was intense as major landmasses such as Laurentia, Baltica and Gondwana shifted. At the start of the Ordovician, Gondwana, the largest supercontinent, was centered in the Southern Hemisphere. Later, Gondwana drifted toward the South Pole, triggering a massive glaciation event. This ice age caused a significant drop in sea levels, severely impacting marine life and leading to one of the largest mass extinctions, during which approximately 85% of marine species went extinct. Following the ice age, the climate recovered during the Silurian, becoming more stable. Temperatures gradually rose and the climate became warmer and more humid. The challenge of finding gold in the mountains is significantly greater than glacial gold prospecting, which involves gold transported and deposited by glaciers. Gold in mountain streams has limited distribution, requiring prospectors to identify specific gold spots along the stream through careful exploration and then systematically follow these leads. This process demands substantial effort and not every gold prospector is willing to invest such time and energy during their leisure. Using geological maps, I aim to demonstrate this process to you. The northeastern part of Scandinavia, the northeastern part of Scandinavia serves as example one. From a geological perspective, Scandinavia is among the oldest regions on Earth. Its geological foundation is formed by the Baltic Shield, a vast area composed of ancient, primarily crystalline rocks. These rocks mostly date back to the Precambrian era and are approximately 1.5 to 3.2 billion years old. Crystalline rocks often form the bedrock of the Earth's crust, commonly found in so-called shield regions, such as the Canadian Shield or the Baltic Shield. There are two main types of crystalline rocks, but for us gold prospectors, igneous rocks are the most significant. These rocks form deep beneath the Earth's surface, where magma cools and solidifies slowly. This gradual cooling allows large, well-formed crystals to develop. Typical examples include granite, diorite, and gabbro. But back to example number one. Diorite is already present here. And everything shown in light green is the magmatic rock diorite. The glacial ice from the Ice Age eroded this rock and spread the existing gold over a distance of 330 kilometers. This geological map shows the distribution of gold. A similar gold distribution exists in Bavaria as well, though not over 330 kilometers, but it is still quite extensive, if I may say so. Examples include areas like Tronstein and Erding, extending up to just before Degendorf. Personally, I have found many gold traces in these regions, and that's what I wanted to show you. This legend shows the gold combinations found in this area. 
I love this geological map material because you can learn so much from it and apply that knowledge in your own gold prospecting. Now, let's turn to gold prospecting in alpine regions. The distribution of gold in mountain streams is generally sparse, especially in smaller streams, as geological maps often confirm. These maps also provide valuable insights into the depth and thickness of gold-bearing layers, enabling a more precise assessment. For gold prospecting in the Alps, this means that surface gold finds alone are often insufficient. A detailed depth exploration is necessary to fully uncover the true potential. As I've mentioned before, there is so much to learn from these geological maps, and these insights can be effectively applied to gold prospecting in the Alps. Back to my gold prospecting in the Alps. This area is a prime example of metamorphic hydrothermal mineralization. Here, tectonic, magmatic, and hydrothermal processes converge. Gold deposits are typically structurally linked to tectonic faults and foliation planes formed during the alpine orogeny. Understanding this background is crucial for gold prospecting in this region, since I know that hydrothermal processes have occurred here. I also need to pay attention to the associated minerals during my search to determine where gold distribution begins along the stream bed. At the same time, I must identify on site where zones of weakness in the mountains are draining to the left and right. Hot hydrothermal solutions have penetrated the rock along these zones of weakness, and the current erosion of these zones forms the drainage paths for these areas. Such drainage accumulates in the stream bed, as you can see here. Makes sense, doesn't it? The associated minerals for this geological environment are typically arsenopyrite, tetrahedrite, chalcopyrite, sphalerite, and pyrite. These minerals play a crucial role in gold bonding. The gold is present partly as free gold and partly in chemical bonds with arsenopyrite. This chemical bonding is often very difficult to detect, and I hope to analyze it more effectively in a laboratory setting in the future. Now, an important detail comes into play for me, which I call structural control. Quartz veins are the primary carriers of gold mineralization. These veins formed along tectonic faults where hydrothermal fluids circulated, and they often show rhythmic variations, indicating pulsating fluid flows. In summary, this means for me, the alpine metamorphism in this region caused a recrystallization of minerals, reorganizing the gold distribution to some extent. Gold migrated along shear zones and concentrated in secondary quartz veins. In this process, tetrahedrite is of particular importance to me because it is a typical hydrothermal vein mineral formed at low to medium temperature ranges. Tetrahedrite is also an indicator of metal-rich hydrothermal systems. Its formation results from the circulation of hot, metal-rich hydrothermal solutions through fracture and fault systems. And it is precisely these fracture and fault systems that I can observe here. Initial cleanup, conducted before the tectonic event zone, revealed that only a minimal amount of heavy minerals, or black sand, had accumulated in this area. There was no gold present. In the second section, we found a calmer flow zone directly beneath the tectonic event area. Here, the concentration of heavy minerals was significantly higher than in the first zone. But first, let me share this beautiful moment with you. Don't click away. Just take a moment to enjoy these few seconds.
couldn't detect any gold here either. However, to be fair, I did not conduct a detailed analysis of the tectonic event zone, and I'm almost convinced that only a small portion of this fracture and fault system contains gold, as the third prospecting area, much further downstream, did produce gold. By the way, did you notice the massive quartz on the left side of the image in the impression? I told you not to skip ahead in the video, so anyone who skipped, go back. I honestly didn't expect to find a rock of this size and was pleasantly surprised. However, such formations clearly indicate that I'm in the right environment. This makes me really excited. In the third prospecting area, the stream's morphology changed drastically. The proportion of alluvial sand was significantly higher compared to the upstream section. This alluvial sand contained a notable amount of minerals with high densities. Gold was already detectable in the surface alluvial sand. Under the microscope, I can now present my first mesothermal orogenic gold sample. This gold specimen was separated from the streambed material at the surface. Practically just a few shovels of stream material were taken. A depth exploration is still pending, and I'll provide updates on that process in due course. I've been exploring this area around the discovery site for some time with the aim of identifying remnants of unregistered small-scale mining operations. I'm practically always equipped with my geologist's hammer and binoculars in this region. By the way, such structures are often hard to recognize and require careful visual analysis. The use of binoculars is particularly helpful in filtering out characteristic geological or anthropogenic features from the surroundings. So far, I've been able to locate five potential sites of such small-scale mining operations. The largest measures around 240 meters, and the second largest approximately 100 meters. I plan to visit these locations soon to determine what was mined there. I've had some success in this regard in the past, and I'm excited to continue. And with that, I'll wrap up this video report. I'll see you in my next video. Until then, stay healthy.